I'd like to welcome everyone to our first Grand Rounds of 2024. And it's truly a special, special Grand Rounds. We are privileged today to have Dr. Christine Menius as our esteemed speaker. Now, Dr. Menius received her MD degree from the George Washington University School of Medicine in Washington, DC. She completed a residency in abdominal imaging and an abdominal imaging fellowship at the Malincott Institute of Radiology at Washington University in St. Louis, where she stayed on as faculty for 15 years before coming to Mayo Clinic, Arizona in 2013, where she is currently a professor of radiology in the abdominal radiology section. Now, Dr. Menius is arguably the gold standard when it comes to radiology education. In fact, I would go so far as to say that she is the GOAT. <laughs> the greatest of all time. Now she's been awarded almost every education accolade out there, not only from the institutions she's been at, but from all our most respected national and international societies, including being a lifetime honor educator from RSNA. Um, she's been the gold medal recipient from the Society of Abdominal Radiology in 2023. She was uh, American Rankin Ray Educator of the Year in 2019, the Aunt Minnie Most Effective Radiology Educator in 2022. But perhaps like many, I first encountered her kind of indirectly as a radiology resident through reading some of one of her hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of peer reviewed publications. And actually I didn't tell you this, I was saving this. The second time I met you was actually in Louisville, Kentucky. Oops. <laughs> we were talking about the oral boards and she happened to be my GI session examiner for the oral boards. Was I nice? I remember <laughs> fumbling through the first case it was a basic, I'm not going to tell you what it was, I'm not allowed to, but it's a basic benign liver lesion that all of you guys would nail. Um, but I fumbled and I actually don't know what I said, but I do remember she told me to take a deep breath, clear my mind and take the case again. Um, I'm happy to report that I did pass my oral boards. <laughs> That day, so thank you, Cookie, for calming my nerves. Now, when I asked her about which one of the many leadership positions she's most proud of, she was quick to say she's most proud of her current role as editor-in-chief of Radiographics, our leading education journal of radiology, and the very first female editor-in-chief. <laughs> now, there's no doubt that Dr. Menius has had a profound impact on so many trainees and faculty uh, in radiology, many of which are in the audience, in person, in the virtual audience. We are so grateful to finally, finally host her here at Yale. Faculty and trainees, please give a huge round of applause and welcome to Dr. Christine Menius. Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. I feel like I have to pay you after this, uh, maybe, um, from that bribery situation. Um, so I'm uh, very... Um, Happy to be here, and I want to thank um, Yale and Dr. Mahan to who invited me here. And no, you didn't struggle getting me here. You just asked. I'm like, yep, I'll be there. I'd love to go to Yale. I've never been here. Such a beautiful um, institution, and so I'm very excited uh, to be here. Um, I'm also excited to uh, lecture on one of uh, you know an important thing for me, and that's oncologic uh, therapies and what we are seeing in the abdomen um, after. Uh, these patients are being treated. So uh, my financial disclosures, I do have some book royalties. And as he said, I'm the editor of Radiographics. And I do want to have some special thanks uh, to um, some colleagues of mine who've helped me with some of the animations. Um, keep in mind, if you uh, are interested and like to follow uh, interesting cases, um, you can go ahead and follow uh, at Cases in the Cookie Jar. And we have it in Spanish for our Spanish uh, trainees as well. All right, so um, there is a huge a new era of oncologic therapies that we are seeing in our patients and you know, treatment paradigms in cancer therapy are rapidly evolving. And uh, you know, many of our patients are being you know, exposed to this you know, uh, huge explosion of engineered and targeted therapies. And uh, you know, I'm going to take a little bit of time in um, talking about some of these uh, therapies that we see in our patients, particularly targeted 
therapies and immunotherapy. So, uh, you know, there has been a huge advancement in personalized and dedicated precision medicine and where uh, our oncologists and our therapies are targeting certain uh, cancer mutations in our patients and uh, uh, really uh, personalizing the therapies according to the tumor genetics and molecular profile of our patients that we're seeing you know, a different um, shift in our cancer treatments. You could see in 1997, our first targeted therapy, rituximab, which has been uh, strategic in our lymphoma patients uh, to you know, now nearly over 100 uh, FDA uh, approved targeted cancer therapies. In fact, it's one of the biggest uh, features that we're seeing now with the rec record number of FDA approved targeted therapies uh, for our patients. Uh, that we're just getting uh, more and more um, as the years go by. All right, so let's just talk about targeted therapies and they can result in adverse effects, particularly on the targeted organs uh, where you're trying to uh, you know, kill the tumor, but they also have some off-target organ effects, meaning you know, it goes to the wrong pathway or there, you know, there's a wrong organ that's involved and in having adverse effects. And these adverse effects can be uh, due to a rapid tumor shrinkage where you might see hemorrhage or some tumor bowel fistula from the response to therapy to some weird overzealous pathway, you know, blockade where you see some perforation or vascular occlusions to even some weird autoimmune self attacks, which is in particular in our uh, immunotherapies, which we'll talk about. And so understanding how these therapies works is crucial for understanding the expected treatment responses and the potential adverse effects that you may see in your patients. So as you look in the literature, you can see that there is you know, a long list of adverse effects in the GI uh, uh, tract due to targeted therapies. And you know, to be honest, uh, the list to memorize all these meds, it's, it you know, can be quite Overwhelming. I mean, ridiculous, actually, um, to the point. And there's new, uh, you know, therapies coming in and out um, every uh, day. But if you look a little bit more, you can see that there is, you know, commonality to it. Most, uh, if not all, of these weird uh, adverse effects are due to bevacizumab, okay, Avastin, if you will, and tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Okay, so tyrosine kinase inhibitors and bevacizumab are the, uh, the two different um, targeted therapies that result in you know, a long list of these adverse effects in, uh, that's reported. I can even make it easier. So bevacizumab and tyrosine kinase inhibitors, what are the tyrosine kinase inhibitors? Well, they end with nibs. So I call them the MABs and the nibs. You don't have to memorize the name. Just look, does they end with a MAB? Does it end with a nibs? It's a MAB or a nibs. And I can tell you, it's likely going to be the source of these weird things that you're seeing in your patients. All right, so how can we make this any uh, simpler? How do we get rid of this? Um, so when you are seeing your cancer patients and you're doing your follow-up and you see um, some weird things happening, you're like, when you start asking what the heck, what, what the heck is going on? You know, is, is there something going on in atypical or unexpected response? Then I would check the clinical chart. Is the patient on any nib or any map? And you can be the first person that can guide management in these patients uh, where you're seeing these adverse effects. For example, a patient who's on imitimib or Gleevec, you could see that there's two more bowel fistula. When you start seeing perforations of the gut or ischemic areas, you know, and you look and there are patients on a nib, um, you can really uh, guide uh, these uh, patients by uh, documenting that it may be indeed targeted therapies. So let's just talk about anti-angiogenic molecular target agents. Okay, so we're we're not talking about chemotherapy particularly. We're talking about these molecular targeted therapies, and in particular, anti-angiogenesis, just like it says uh, on it. These are anti-vascular endothelial growth factor agents, and they can either target 
um, the uh, by monoclonal antibody on the receptors, which we call bevacizumab, or they work intracellular in the cellular unit, and these are your tyrosine kinase inhibitors, the NIBs. So either it's the monoclonal antibody, Avastin or bevacizumab, or they're the NIBs. And I want to remind you that these agents are cytostatic, so it kills the, the blood vessels and not necessarily cytotoxic until the end. So uh, it basically sucks the lifeline, deprives the tumor of the blood supply that's needed to grow and to invade and to metastasize. So uh, the goal is to uh, deprive uh, the, anti the angiogenesis effect of these tumors. So here, for example, you can see metastatic renal cell with hypervascularity that, you know, yes, it becomes cytotoxic at the end, but really it's the, uh, the decreased enhancement and the anti-angiogenesis effect of it. So because it deprives the blood supply of these tumors, there is going to be complications. You will see increased venous thrombosis. You will see pulmonary embolism, DVT, clot in you know, uh, the vessels of the gut. You will see blood uh, bowel ischemia. You will see perforation. And you have an increased incidence or risk of GI bleeding and uh, impaired lymphangiogenesis, which is needed uh, for, um, for uh, these uh, growths, and importantly, impair, impaired wound healing. Let me just go back to that. So VEGF is an agent that we have in our bodies that is needed for proper clotting, for proper uh, response to wound healing. So if a patient is on anti-angiogenic uh, agents, you're impairing their wound healing. And we'll talk and we'll see some cases about this, but let's say if you have a patient who is on Avastin and happens to have diverticulitis. That patient takes forever to heal the diverticulitis because he's on a vast, it ne it's needed for healing, it's needed for proper, uh, for proper um, um, recovery and uh, tumor uh, and body response to um, infection and for um, uh, uh, some post-operative change. So this meal is interesting. Okay. So angiogenesis and oncology, and just to remind us, you know, normal tissue has very organized blood supply. It's, you know, it kind of behaves, you know, when you get into neovascularity, uh, the vessels become very unorganized, haphazard. And the beauty of these anti-angiogenesis, it basically uh, results in cytostasis of the blood uh, 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 vascular tumor niche and the goal is to present, prevent new blood vessel formation and prune the existing um, uh, areas. So you have a patient who has got metastatic renal cell again, multiple hypervascular metastases to the liver and uh, following on a nib, if you will, a tyrosine kinase inhibitors, you could see the tumoral response to the liver, not necessarily so much decrease in size, but the anti-angiogenic effect of the tumor all showing great response to um, targeted therapy. So some of the atypical responses we see uh, is pneumatosis. It's actually, it's actually very common in the busy cancer center. You know, almost everybody with brain metastasis is on steroids. Many of our cancer patients are on steroids. And guess what steroids do? It sure enough causes pneumatosis. Um, but you can see it with a lot of other drugs. Again, you're not memorizing, but... And the nib can give you pneumatosis and bevacizumab uh, can give uh, pneumatosis. So here, for example, you know, our uh, patients who have diffuse um, colonic pneumatosis uh, on uh, bevacizumab um, in their therapies. So how do you know if this pneumatosis is, you know, the scary ones that you think about ischemic or, um, you know, you know, uh, you know, dying gut, if you will? Well, I will argue the you know pneumatosis uh, of the benign variety or longer segments. Uh, number one, number two, it's pretty. What do I mean, pretty? Well, it's kind of it's beautiful. There's no mesenteric edema. There's no you know uh, your response to the mesentery from a you know a uh, the gut with the pneumatosis. I mean, a dying gut 
is not going to be pretty, right? A dying gut is going to be ugly. Mesentery is going to be involved and um, you will see some changes. I will put that caveat. We see very sick and stage cancer patients who are on target therapies, who have ascites, who have a mesenteric edema, and you see pneumatosis, you're going to have to have that, um, you know, a clinician or surgeon press on the patient's belly to make sure there's not an acute abdomen. So, you know, it's uh, something that they're, uh, co uh, they're commonly seen. Most patients are managed conservatively. They just stop the agent, they get a the drug holiday and gets put to, uh, to rest. Keep in mind, the cysts can pop. And the cysts can cause free air with little symptoms. And now we're all freaking out. We're calling everybody, there's free air, there's hematosis, I'm really worried, blah, blah, blah. And you just have to bring it down a little bit, have somebody examine to make sure the patient doesn't have an acute abdomen. But typically, they're just a very uh, benign bellies. I mean, there is a little sterile peritonitis that develops, but it's not to the point that it's like a dying or, or perforated uh, gut. The other thing that happens is we see at one point of time, but this, this, this pneumatosis can last for weeks and they keep scanning every three days, follow up pneumatosis. And it just, you know, you have to call them and say, stop following. It's going to be there unless there's a clinical feature that dictates uh, to uh, image a patient. So here, for example, you know, is a patient who's on uh, Herceptin, which is trastuzumab, again, a target agent. You could see the pretty component of the pneumatosis. I mean, there's nothing going around. Um, of that colon, and you know, no one uh, was very comfortable with this. And you know, you know, surgery asked us to. Don't ask me why, but we did an enema five days later, and you could see the underlying colon uh, is pristine in a patient with benign uh, pneumatosis. Another patient uh, with myeloma who is on a uh, very um, long regimen that includes uh, steroids, like methods, and you know had diffuse hematosis that perforated. So you can see there's free air, large amount of free air. Hanging out is an outpatient, right? So this is an outpatient follow-up uh, with myeloma. And this is what we see. And he kept coming back and coming back. And, and this is the outpatient KUB eight days later. And then we said, stop following the, you know, stop following it unless there's a clinical uh, reason uh, to it. So this is what happens in these patients that you have to be uh, comfortable that you will see in your cancer patients. All right, there is that pitfall I just said because there is an increased incidence of thrombosis. So, you know, chemo and targeted therapies can cause arterial venous thrombosis. Um, and, you know, the agents that we talked about is bevacizumab and your, and your NIBs, but there are other agents, your platinum based agents, which, you know, almost all of our GU and our GYN cancers and, you know, some of our pancreas cancers are on. Um, you can see um, uh, some uh, vascular thrombosis in this case. And so, again, I ask you to, you know, in an unexpected response. So here, for example, is a young, a young kid. I call him kid because he's younger than me, 41 years old, right? He is, you know, following, he's coming with acute abdominal pain. He's, you know, got germ cell, metastatic germ cell tumor. He's on cisplatinum. What the heck is happening? He's got SMA thrombosis, right? This is the... This is the uh, chemo and target therapies that are causing the thrombosis of the vessel and complete dead gut. And, you know, here's a patient metastatic ovarian cancer on like third line therapy now. And you could see that there's diffuse, you know, IVC thrombosis in that patient. And you can argue, well, the cancer is hypercoagulable. And why can't that be the source of cancer? And yes and no. But if you follow the regimen of when targeted therapy is, you could see that there is definitely a timeline um, and many times you can pinpoint it that it's on your targeted therapies. Okay, other things that you might see is some weird vasculopathies or, uh, or aortitis that happens on the patients um, where you can look for a typical response. Like for example, this is a patient uh, with pancreatic uh, carcinoma treated with gemcitabine. You could see only on one month follow-up uh, valuation, you know, that is some vasculitis uh, that's developing in this patient one month after starting the therapy. So it can be seen in uh, your bevacizumab and your nibs and gemzar, your gemcitabine uh, that can cause um, some weird thromboembolic uh, complications. All right, let's just um, sit with a few minutes on bevacizumab. 
um, bevacizumab or Vastin is that monoclonal antibody that targets uh, VEGF, your vascular endothelial growth factor receptor. And it's a phenomenal drug. It's fantastic on many cancers of the colon, the brain, cervix, ovary, kidney, uh, a, a beautiful drug, but it causes GI perforation. And you have to keep that in your mind um, in these patients. But we have to ask, why does it cause GI perforation? Okay, remember, it sucks the blood supply of the tumor. So you are going to have you know, uh, a huge tumor response in that patient. So if you have an advanced rectal cancer, so a rectal cancer in situ, and the patient's given a bevacizumab and the tumor is shrinking, that primary tumor can perforate and cause uh, and present with uh, GI perforation or rectal perforation because that tumor in situ is being treated with Avastin. The other thing is patients with metastatic serosal peritoneal implants that are sitting on the gut. Guess what? Those serosal implants respond to bevacizumab, decrease, but perforate the underlying bowel. And you see this particularly in ovarian cancer with peritoneal mets, but you know, there are colon cancer with peritoneal mets. Um, when there's tumor shrinkage, uh, it weakens that wall and causes um, uh, bowel perforation. And the third thing, again, impaired healing. This is what many of us forget. Our oncologists forget. The patient cannot respond uh, to healing, to what's going on. So for example, patient just had a bowel surgery, had an uh, anastomosis. They wait usually you know, four weeks now. It used to be six weeks, but they're trying to get the patient back on uh, treatment. And guess what? The suture line opens up the nasmosis never heals, not because the surgeon did it wrong, not because there's a problem, but the patient was put on a vastin a little bit too early for that patient and the anastomosis breaks down. So you will see anastomotic breakdown in patients who are on a, a, a vastin. You will see it in patients who had prior radiation treatment. The bowel can't heal. They can't heal and very inflamed for a long time. And again, I talked about the diverticulitis because many of our cancer patients are just normal patients that have other um, issues that just don't heal when they're on Avastin. All right, other things that you might see um, in uh, patients with nibs or tyrosine kinase inhibitors are uh, this fluid retention, it's anosarca. It's an atypical response, but it's very common. And it's actually one of the, uh, important limiting drug uh, regimens. In fact, this is what they complain the most of. They become heavy. They can't lift up their legs. They can't walk. They're, you know, fluid uh, spacing. Um, and it's unclear on what that source of is there a capillary leak, uh, but there is a diffuse anosarca uh, on these patients and should not be mistaken for disease progression because we all freak out when there's anosarca, but the anosarca is just the second effect of these uh, therapies. So here's a patient who's got a large hypervascular gist and who's on Gleevec, and you could see the diffuse soft tissue body wall edema, pleural fusions, uh, and ascites in this patient. It, and it's in, in any of the um, IBS, if you will, um, uh, of fluid retention uh, in these patients. This is a patient who is on a PARP inhibitor. Um, look at the diffuse nature of the third spacing uh, the tumoral is not extensive in the, uh, the body, it's responding, but you could see um, that the patient is going to get off this med because of the extensive third spacing that basically uh, is their dose limiting uh, problem. Other things that uh, you will see that's a little bit odd is uh, lymphangiectasia. What's going on? Well, TKIs, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, inhibit lymphangiogenesis. And that in itself results in protein losing enteropathy. And so they become hypoproteinemic. They have some lymphopenia. When you look at the, uh, the uh, blood counts, they pre present with this watery diarrhea and again, third sp spacing. And it's such to the point that these dilated lymphatics become so dilated that you start seeing these dilated, uh, dilated uh, fat, macroscopic fat in the wall. And I will argue, particularly in pazopinib, and many of our advanced renal cell carcinoma patients, our sarcoma patients are on it. And so it's, you know, it's very odd. You all kind of freak out. You don't know what's going on. Um, it is, this is the lymphangiectasia that develops in uh, patients with TKI uh, treatment. 
it can be very exuberant. And you could see this patient who's got advanced renal cell carcinoma with tumor in the vein. Uh, you could see the diffuse lymphagectasia in uh, this patient, um, the fat on the uh, CT, but the T2 bright and the correlate uh, endoscopy, enteroscopy in these patients. No, 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 nobody likes to sit on that until you start saying, this is just a lymphagectasia, but the source of the diarrhea. And they keep them on as long as they can tolerate the diarrhea because it does have an effect on uh, the tumor uh, response. Other things that you may see that's a little bit odd um, that you should be familiar with is patients with uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia who's, who are on ibrutinib. That is the targeted uh, standard therapies now. Um, it used to be rituximab. Some are still on rituximab, but ibrutinib is the uh, agent of choice in these patients. And you start seeing weird fat deposition in lymph nodes. And it's believed that the lymphatic tissue becomes, you know, atrophied, it responds to the therapy, and the central hyalur fat becomes big. So it becomes, so, um, you know, macroscopic fatty replacement, not metaplastic, it's just fatty replacement of the node. This is not liposarcoma. This is not teratomatous change. I can see all the reports coming through. This is a, a on-target uh, response to ibrutinib with the macroscopic fatty uh, deposition here at three different patients showing um, what you may see um, in these patients. All right, when uh, patients are on these uh, regimens, um, uh, you might see a rapid shrinkage of tumor. And when the rapid shrinkage of tumor is sitting on the gut, it can cause you know, tumoral bowel fistula where it can you know, decrease in size and then fistulize to the gut. Uh, so here, for example, another uh, uh, gastrointestinal stromal tumor on uh, imitimib, and you could see the rapid response and tumoral response to uh, the target therapies. But what's happening, you start seeing gas in that lumen that's uh, you know not doing well, and you, you're gonna say this is a tumoral bowel fistula and uh, you know they're asymptomatic or they're happy-go-lucky. They're not presenting. They're not playing, presenting with GI bleed. Some do, but most don't. And it's typically managed conservatively. And they actually keep them on the medicine because it's responding. You know, you're you're can't you're killing that cancer, and they keep them until there is uh, you know a symptomatic um, change in that patient. All right, other things that you might see is, you know, hepatic toxicity, and that can range from just elevated liver function, enzymes and hepatopathies um, to fulminant liver uh, failure. And you're going to see this on both uh, chemotoxic agents and targeted therapies, uh, particularly on your fulfiri uh, regimens, colon cancer, your pancreatic cancers, your advanced, they're all on fulfiri. That's the targeted agent of choice. Uh, where you start seeing, uh, you know, fatty change, particularly both by the 5-FU and arena tecan. Macroscopic fat also with uh, bevacizumab, you could see, you know, this patient with uh, colorectal liver mats and you start seeing fatty change to it. That is the uh, targeted therapy working in the liver um, and also killing normal uh, liver cells uh, in its pathway. So in these patients with um, steatosis, um, you just want to kind of understand what drugs are giving them fatty liver because you are seeing follow-up on these patients. So, you know, steatosis can be with uh, both 5-FU uh, and uh, bevacizumab, but steatohepatitis, which we worry most, ending with liver failure uh, and a fibrotic liver can be in arenotecan type therapies, particularly fulfiri. So here is a patient um, with uh, metastatic uh, colorectal liver metastasis um, and uh, being uh, uh, treated by fulfiri and bevacizumab and you know now going for hepatic uh, metastectomies by surgery. And this is what the surgeons you know call the yellow liver. They open up, it's yellow. Now they're going to resect what is the liver function that's going to re you know remnant in that patient. So something you have to keep in mind, and it should be reported. The underlying, you know, liver is markedly diffuse fatty, and many of these patients go to uh, MR to, uh, you know, evaluate uh, prior to a resection. 
All right. So, you know, there is a pitfall, right? We see patients coming for follow-up. You have, you know, a patient who's got metastatic colorectal cancer, awful fury. You know, you see multiple liver mets, you know, follow-up, you have fatty liver and you're like, oh, where's the other tumor? Don't say it's responded. Don't say you don't see it. The liver is fatty. You're not seeing the liver uh, under, and these patients need to go to MR on follow-up. They need to go to MR to see uh, the, you know, uh, particularly hepatocyte-specific uh, agents and having diffusion to evaluate. All right, here's a recent case. I just had this case. Here's a patient who uh, uh, has a metastatic breast carcinoma. The liver is uh, very fatty. It's kind of edematous. There's a pleural fusion on it. And, you know, you can't see anything. Well, look at their MR two days later. I mean, it's riddled by tumor. And this is what you have to remind, remember in your fatty livers. You just can't see tiny miliary uh, deposits in the liver. All right. Having said that, she ended up having a SOS uh, from a tumoral infiltration of the uh, sinusoids. Well, what is the SOS? Well, I mean, the, the agents, these targeted agents, and these chemotherapies, particularly oxali, you know, oxaliplatinum, oxaliplatinum is the uh, drug that associated with SOS. It causes toxicity to the hepatocytes and the epithelial cells, and they sloth, and they sloth, and then they start filling the vascular channels. They fill the sinusoids, and then they cause, you know, they cause sinusoidal obstruction. You know, the sinusoids of the draining veins, if you will. Um, is what we end up seeing. So you see a very congested liver. You might see very pruned hepatic veins on it. And this is what the the surgeons know the blue the blue liver, the you know congested liver from oxaliplatinum uh, induced uh, hepatic dysfunction. So if you start seeing a liver that's you know congested looking, you see ascites. The spleen might be normal size, but bigger than it was before. Maybe it was eight before. Now it's still it's 11, it's still normal size, but it's bigger. There is, there is portal venous hypertension that's developing in that patient. And you need to let them know that they need to get off their oxali uh, because it's calling, causing uh, the liver uh, failure. Other um, liver uh, toxicities that we see is, uh, you know, patients who are trastuzumab, Herceptin, fantastic drug on a HER2 positive gastric and esophageal cancer, what we see from the abdomen, but breast cancer. Um, uh, but it is hepatotoxic to the liver, particularly in patients who have underlying liver metastasis. So the agent is killing the tumor, but it's killing the uh, underlying liver as well. And it causes a fibrotic component uh, with uh, this. So why is it called pseudo? Well, it's not true fibrotic. There's no bridging fibrosis by path, but don't let that fool you. It is definitely serotic by its playing mechanism. It causes portal hypertension. It causes varices. The, the spleen gets bigger. They uh, end up with GI bleeds from their varices. And again, this is another one you need to follow up at MR. Who in their right mind is going to be able to tell what's fibrosis and what's underlying residual tumor? You really need uh, diffusion-weighted imaging in these patients. So all pseudocerotic patients should be followed with MR. Uh, in particular, but look at this is three months after treatment. Look at that underlying, you know, serotic or pseudo serotic component uh, to that liver, and the spleen is getting bigger, even though it's still normal in size. All right, here, for example, is a patient. You know, you could see pre chemotherapy. There's a couple of liver metastases. Two months, maybe, maybe there's some developing. Four months, definitely, there's developing of a uh, nodular surface contour. And this is only after one year of treatment. Sure, the liver is attenuating or fibrotically, uh, uh, including the tumor, but it's causing the pseudo serotic component and the portal gastropathy and the varices that's developing in this patient. All right, other hepatic toxicity that you might see is kind of a secondary sclerosing cholangiopathy uh, with your nibs. And, you know, this is a patient with uh, uh, sutent, sutent that's showing the, you know, the biliary stricturing that can develop in these patients. Uh, we already talked about bevacizumab and tyrosine kinase causing, you know, portal vein and thrombosis of the vessels. And uh, there is an entity called, you know, autoimmune hepatopathy, hepatitis, in patients who are immunotherapy. 
So I just want to take a, a minute to, to talk a little bit about colorectal tumor response uh, because, you know, many of our patients who have advanced or metastatic colorectal are on targeted uh, bevacizumab, right? They're on bevacizumab and other types of um, targeted therapies. And um, it, again, it's cytostatic and may not show a decreased size by rhesus criteria. So that is important to remember in your patients when you follow up. And when you are seeing that decrease in size, decrease density, decrease enhancement with you know, more sharp uh, tumor liver interface, that is a feature of um, tumor response. And it out it out uh, runs rhesus criteria. What does that mean? The tumor could be the same size, but now it's decreased enhancement. And that is a tumor response and not necessarily stable disease, stable by rhesus, but not stable by um, uh, therapy that is undergoing. So, you know, here's a patient stage uh, four, you could see, yeah, the tumor is shrinking, but not as much, but look at that, uh, you know, decreased enhancement, look at the, you know, more well-defined sharp interface between the tumor and the liver. That's a phenomenal response with bevacizumab. So I'm going to just show you three cases here, all three cases meeting Reese's criteria of stable disease, all three showing a beautiful response to bevacizumab of decreased enhancement, better uh, you know, tumor um, liver interface. And yes, you want to say all show, it, this is a positive response. I say anti-angiogenic effect of a response to bevacizumab, stable size, but response to the tumor. All right, just um, ending with immunotherapy. Um, you know, before 2011, immunotherapy was just not a reliable drug uh, uh, agent, sorry, agent. Um, it was very toxic on all the trials. Um, and, you know, they were almost going to give up on it. And then 2011, IPI came along and IPI was very uh, phenomenal as a melanoma uh, agent and showing, you know, phenomenal response to the point where, you know, there are, you know, several agents that are now being um, uh, FDA approved. There's, you know, well over 20 agents that are being uh, trialed in every cancer. They try it, you know, to try to get receptors on that. That's why you buy you 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 uh, biopsy everything possible to see if there's any PDL inhibitors or PD1 inhibitor, you know, um, uh, receptors, so it can respond to immunotherapy. And in fact, it's it's first line, second line, or third line of almost every tumor that's out there uh, in you know the parenchymal uh, tumors, and it, it becomes a challenge to both oncologists and radiologists to, you know, what are we doing? Uh, you know, are we, we're all learning this. We're learning what it's doing in terms of the response to therapy, as well as these adverse effects that we're seeing. Um, and it's more of a communication uh, with oncology um, to see if um, patients should, uh, you know, continue or not. Uh, you know, and, you know, as we know, it's, you know, it was a Nobel Prize winner in 2018 um, because of their, um, findings of um, uh, the CTLA-1, uh, CTLA-4, and uh, PD uh, uh, receptor inhibitors. Okay, I'm, I'm going to simplify it. It's you know a bigger molecular profile than this, but you know it immuno differs from chemo because chemo attacks the tumor. Immuno is different. Immuno you know targets the patient's immune system, revs up the T4 cells. I'm ready to kill the tumor, and the T4 cells then attack the tumor. But because these T4 cells are going crazy, what else are they going to do? They're going to attack the patient back. It starts seeing these autoimmune responses to the patients. And so this is the, you know, the adverse effects that we see with immunotherapy. It's because the T cells are activated to kill the tumor as well as, you know, kill, you know, cells uh, or activate cells in uh, the body. And so these adverse effects that we all are freaking out about, showing the oncologists that the agents are working. And so it's a balance. So it's a balance uh, for the oncologist um, to see if the patient should continue on immunotherapy um, and deal with these adverse effects. And there's a lot of adverse effects. They have diarrhea, they have a rash, they have hypertension, um, you know, they have start having muscle, myositis, fasciitis. It's a big thing. The, the, the T4 cells are 
going crazy and activating against uh, the body and the self attack. And, uh, you know, unless we are familiar with it, we, you know, we can call it disease progression, but it tells the oncologist that the immunotherapy is working. So if they see the hypertension, they know the immunotherapy is working. If they see the rash, um, the dermatitis, they know that the immunotherapy is working. And then they just give, you know, uh, you know, a little bit of steroids to calm down the T4 cells on it. So we see these weird things. We see, you know, lymph nodes get enlarged, sarcoid type of reaction. They have a muscle aching from uh, myopathies um, and uh, they present with a sloughing and colitis uh, of their gut. So these are called autoimmune, immune-related adverse effects, okay? They're not complications. They're just adverse effects because it's expected when the T4 cells are revved up to attack. And so, you know, if you're not familiar with patients who, you know, with melanoma or getting a follow-up PET and you start seeing activity in the muscles, uh, you know, that's, you know, uh, myositis related to the immunotherapy. We're familiar with the pituitary inflammation that happens in these patients. What, what does that mean? Well, the endocrine effects, adrenal glands are not working. They start, you know, uh, having weird endocrine secondary effects because the pituitary gland is involved by the inflammation. You know, uh, you know, patients who are immunotherapy, you know, get these organizing pneumonias, you know, Pembro and Nevo, all of them can get access to it. And this usually is what ends up in stopping the regimen because it can be quite uh, problematic uh, for the patients in terms of symptoms. Um, and uh, the uh, related uh, colitis or immunotherapy related colitis. And so, um, you know, toxicities differ uh, depending on what agents the patient's on and where um, they uh, begin. So you're not memorizing it, you know, um, but, you know, the only CTLA-4 is IPI, which is the original uh, immunotherapy. And, you know, you could see the four things that involve diarrhea, skin rash, endocrine disorder, and pneumonia. And so, you know, it's a, these adverse effects occur earlier and very severe and they're dose dependent. So they, you know, decrease the dose of immunotherapy and usually gets better. Your PD-1 and PD-L1 are the ones that uh, many of our patients are on now. Uh, these adverse effects can just all, all of a sudden start after being treated for a long time and not dose dependent. So if they decrease it, they still have it. And again, it's the, it's the, you know, four things that you are related, uh, you know, again, pituitary, your thyroid is involved. So it's endocrine, skin rash, lung, and diarrhea. But, you know, oncologists are trying to try anything in our patients who are, you know, not responding and now on third line treatment. Many of them are in combined immunotherapies. And so the adverse effects are quite toxic to the patients. They have severe diarrhea, they have a bad rash, the endocrine, and they begin to have um, a liver uh, failure. So it tells oncologists they're, it's being responding. So let's give them a little bit of steroids. Let's decrease the T4 craziness. Um, and it is telling the oncologist that there is response to immunotherapy. So um, colitis is a very common thing that happens in these patients. They have watery diarrhea. Um, they, again, are treated with steroids. Every patient with diarrhea on immunotherapy, because these are very expensive, very, very expensive uh, agents that are on protocol. And lots, and I can tell you, Yale is probably on a lot of cancer protocols. And everyone gets scoped, right, with that, because they have to confirm and they have to grade the level of the uh, immunotherapy-related colitis. And so we get a very good correlation of what we see by imaging and endoscopy. And there's two different types of colitis that's developed with immunotherapy. Number one, a pan colitis, if you will. It'd be fluid filled. It could be thick walled. Uh, they give them a little bit of steroids. There is something called SCAD, uh, segmental colitis associated with diverticulosis. So in this segment of diverticulosis, there is an immuno-related event. So... You know, if we have a pan colitis, um, uh, is you know it's you know treated with steroids. If there is diverticulosis, where you know the ticks can be full of the enterolus, they're treated with both steroids and antibiotics, and so they have to get a uh, specimen to confirm that um, uh, for the patient. So, um, what we see on imaging 
maybe it's a mild thickening, some fluid filled, you know, even collapsed and thickened. Uh, but it's a very common adverse effect. And I, I, I urge you to follow the colon in your patients. Uh, you know, they know it clinically, they're having diarrhea. You could see it by imaging. Again, resolved with steroid. If they don't, uh, if there is, uh, you know, steroid refractory, then they can start them on uh, Revocade. But look at this, you know, it's mildly thickened flu fit, but look how ugly that uh, colon is, you know, a uh, advanced uh, immunotherapy related colitis. Um, you know, it, it can go up to, you know, 20%, uh, one out of five patients. Again, my is colitis or some mild thickening is fluid filled. Uh, and, you know, this is a patient with grade three, uh, you know, related uh, immunotherapy related colitis. Okay, uh, resolves with the steroid and again tells the uh, oncologist that the therapy is working. What about this patient? This patient was called normal, but that colon is not normal, right? It's thickened, it's collapsed, it was just called collapsed. But look at the, uh, the grade three uh, immunotherapy related colitis. Uh, for that patient. Uh, and that is a feature that you want to, you know, scrutinize the colon uh, in these patients. What about this? Fluid-filled colon. Well, guess what? The colon is a very dumb organ. Its sole responsibility is to absorb fluid and form stool. That's it. That's why people can live without their colons, right? And so when you start seeing the left colon that's fluid-filled in the center, that's not normal. You know, that is a diarrhea state for that patient. And this patient, grade two, three colitis uh, uh, in the patient on Nevo. Other weird uh, autoimmune features that we see uh, is some weird things in the gallbladder, weird things in the pancreas, weird things in the adrenal glands that can develop because the self-attack uh, by the T4 cells. And you could see it kind of looks like autoimmune uh, pancreatitis in, in what you see in patients who are not in on immunotherapy, very bulbous, um, pancreas, it has some FDG avid uptake on PET, you know, and after, you know, stopping the uh, patient, you could see the features, what we see with even autoimmune pancreatitis on the follow-up, you know, follow-up volume loss, some uh, uh, atrophy to the pancreatic parenchyma due to the response of the uh, immunotherapy uh, changes of the uh, pancreas. This doesn't come back. They, you know, end up, you know, with some, you know, chronic features of uh, pancreas uh, and even some ductal um, issues uh, later on uh, in these patients. Um, adrenal uh, uh, gland can also be affected, maybe because the pituitary gland is infected. Here is a patient who has metastatic melanoma. Uh, it started on IPI. Uh, you can see normal sized, uh, normal adrenal glands. Here it is, you know, follow up a couple of months later. What's happening? The adrenal glands are more bulbous. There is some diffusion restriction. It's not metastatic disease in three months. Who is on a patient and immunotherapy? You know, the patient is taken off, and uh, you could see the uh, either normal or you know resolution of the adrenal glands, and they're very tiny. And um, you know, this is you know the features of adrenal glands, and this doesn't come back either. Their adrenal function does not respond. They're on uh, replacement steroids for um, the end um, because the adrenal gland never gets their uh, response after um, having um, autoimmune changes uh, to it. All right, so what do we see on imaging? Uh, well, remember the uh, immunotherapy, you know, you know, expands T cells. T cells are like, you know, revved up and you start seeing infiltration of the tumor. And then there's all of a sudden sometimes a, you know, bigger, bigger you know, size of the tumor uh, on it. And you might see a transient flare and uh, then you have to follow up uh, on these patients because um, the, you know, the tumor will respond and shrink after the T4 cells are attacking uh, the tumor. So um, we see some changes in immunotherapy and atypical responses. Uh, you know, you have a tumor baseline, you might see a interval growth of, you know, one of the lesions uh, you might even see a new lesion, right? And by strict rhesus criteria, that means progression. You are not ever to say progression in your immunotherapy patients, period. Leave that to the oncologist, leave that to the core lab. These are very expensive protocols that the patients are here for the treatment because you don't know if it's progression or if it's T4 cell infiltrations. So on the follow-up, 
it decreases in size on the follow-up, all of it decreases in size, even the new lesion decreases size. And that is what we call pseudoprogression. It is not, uh, yeah, it's 15% of patients, 15% of many patients who are on immunotherapy. And so keep that in mind and please respect the patient to not say in your reports progression. Say decrease or increase. Don't use the word progression um, uh, or response for that matter. All right, and uh, you know, here's a patient, for example, has got metastatic. Look, look what's happening to the nodes. If you really look at it, there's infiltration, there's edema. You can even hallucinate the T4 cells going crazy and inflammation in there. And on the follow-up, you could see what happens. It decreases and there's a response. It goes in any of the tumors that are being treated. You know, there's a revved up, there's an increase in size that decreases on follow-up. Be very careful again. We're very easy to say progression. Do not say that in your immunotherapy uh, patients. Um, these patients, uh, you know, go to, uh, you know, clinical trials. There's core labs following them. And if it's not you guys, it's core labs following them. You know, here is a patient who's got metastatic renal cell, metastatic to the pancreas, okay? Follow-up imaging. What the heck? There's peritoneal carcinomatosis. You know, there's shrink, there's ascites. There's like, this for sure is progression in your mind, right? They follow that patient. Look at the follow-up patient. Four to eight weeks later, you know, the pancreas uh, lesion is still there. It's big, but, you know, the uh, carcinomatosis, this infiltration is revved up, is uh, decreased uh, in this patient. All right, lots of detail, lots of uh, trials uh, for these patients. Uh, and you don't know the nadir, when they start, when they finish, when they start. So you are not following this patient and you leave it to the core trials to dictate when is progression and when is not. Um, and in fact, the guidelines expect them to be in trials, right? So on follow-up for these patients who are reading on core labs, if the lesion is bigger on follow-up or there's a new lesion that's considered immuno, you know, unconfirmed, progressive disease. Again, these are for the core trials. And on follow-up, if uh, uh, it, on the follow-up, one other, you know, regimen, uh, if it gets, continues to get bigger or the, you know, everything gets, you know, bigger than, then you can say, then they say it's confirmed uh, progressive disease, but it's for them to decide that if it's progressive disease or not. All right. So here's a patient, you know, it's got a metastatic disease, you know, follow-up, uh, you know, is doubling size. That's unconfirmed at this point. And, you know, we saw cases that go back down. This one continues to get big. Now it's confirmed uh, progressive disease and they could decide if they want to change immuno or change regimens on, on that point. After I said all that, there is a weird thing called hyperprogression uh, disease. Uh, it's a new thing. Uh, we don't know what is making this craziness of growth uh, you know, why the T4 attacks and, uh, it, you know, causes progressive disease and continues to cause craziness uh, in patients. It's uh, it's un, uh, unclear on this. For example, you know, here is a patient with metastatic melanoma. You can see bilateral adrenal glands. It gets bigger. And, you know, in two two months, it's it's massive. So this is kind of the hyperprogression uh, in growth of kinetics in this. And this is something still in understanding um, uh, the kinetics of these uh, tumors uh, for these uh, patients. Here's another patient, metastatic disease on the baseline. First follow-up is bigger, it's more hypervascular. Second, again, that's, they're usually four to eight to 12 weeks regimens, depending on what the protocol calls uh, in this patient. So that's a big tour um, through a targeted therapy and immunotherapy. You know, uh, widespread use has really revealed a weird, uh, unique drug toxicity and adverse effect profiles. You know, it should not be mistaken for tumor progression once you understand the effect of these targeted therapies. And it's important to look up what therapy they're, uh, why they're reporting, uh, because it can certainly uh, guide appropriate management. Uh, and thanks for your time.